On several occasions I have seen new players come into Exalted 3rd Edition, attracted by the rich setting and the idea of playing a demigod, but then quit the game before they have finished their first character. The reason why some players abandon ship is also the most common criticism of the game itself, namely the thick charm section and the endless customization options. Some players are drawn to the game for that very reason, but others get confused and intimidated. As I personally love the multitude of options, I want to convince the players who consider abandoning ship why they should stay. This is the Pattern Spider, a YouTube channel about all things Exalted, and this video goes through the entire character creation process and writes up a complete example character that you can use yourself if you want to. In this video I will present tips that can help you in your own character creation, such as how to tackle the seemingly bloated charm section. The character I will write will be a Solar Exalted, and I will only take advantage of the Exalted 3rd edition core book for this, but there are supplements available providing even more character creation options. There are 8 steps to character creation. These are concept and cost, attributes, abilities, merits, charms, intimacies and limit trigger, bonus points and finishing touches. I will go through all of them in order, starting with concept and cost. The first step of character creation requires that you think about what type of character you want to play, what role do you want to fill, has the storyteller established any rules or determined a specific theme, what kind of stuff do you want to do in game. At this stage, I encourage that you think about anything that seems fun to you and ask the storyteller if it's something that would fit the game they have in mind. My example character will be based on the first exalted character I ever created many years ago. The only thing I had in mind at this point was that I wanted to play an assassin or a thief. The storyteller has determined that the game will take place somewhere in the scavenger lands, as a new player it's not expected that you should know much about the setting, but it's a good idea to ask the storyteller what kind of environment the game will take place in, what kinds of cultures are prevalent, and if the type of character you want to play can be woven into that setting. Since my storyteller had decided the setting, and I had told them that I wanted to play a sneaky character, they suggested that my character should come from Nexus. It's the biggest city in the world, and it's located close to where the game is going to take place. I decided that my character was an assassin from Nexus, but is now a renegade from their own orga organization. The reason I'm no longer in Nexus is because I'm no longer welcome there, and this basic premise can present some interesting story opportunities if I ever get to visit that place in-game. I'm now happy with the basic premise of my character concept, and it's time for me to pick a cost. There are five solar costs to choose from, Dawn, Zenith, Twilight, Night and Eclipse. Each cost is associated with specific character archetypes. Dawns are mostly associated with warriors, Zeniths with priests or inspiring leaders, Twilights with intellectuals, Knights with different, different roguelike characters, and Eclipses with traveling merchants or diplomats. There's no requirement to be a specific cost if you want to be a specific archetype, but being that cost helps you perform better at that specific role. Since I want to play a former assassin, the storyteller suggests that knight may be the cost that fits me the most. I can do sneaky stuff as every cost, but a knight cost can do it even better. That's good enough for me, so I mark down the knight cost as well as the anima powers that gives me. So, I have decided that I'm a former assassin on the run from their own organization. I come from Nexus, which is a few hundred miles from the place where the game will take place, and I am a solar exalted of the night cost. Thinking more about this character concept, I decide that I am an, an orphan, have some loved ones in Nexus that are basically held hostage by the organization, and I specialize in poisons. I choose to go by the name Wiper, which is not my real name, but rather something that was given to me by the organization when they took me in as a child. With all that in mind, we proceed to the next step where we're supposed to pick the character's attributes. There are nine attributes in total, all divided into three categories. The physical attributes consist of strength, dexterity and stamina. The social attributes consist of charisma, manipulation and appearance and the mental attributes consist of perception, intelligence and wits. Each attribute ranges from 1 to 5 dots and has a single free dot from the start. At this step we're supposed to decide which category is primary, which is secondary and which is tertiary, and then divide 8, 6 and 4 dots amongst them. 
I personally find it easier to start out by dividing four dots in all categories and then build up in those I feel like I should exceed in. Having done that, I have selected Strength 2, Dexterity 3 and Stamina 2. I want to be a fit character who can survive dangerous situations, but my life as an assassin has taught me to be more quick and agile than have brute strength. That's why I choose to have more in Dexterity than in the other physical traits. Among the social traits, I pick Charisma 2, Manipulation 3 and Appearance 2. The reason for this is because I consider that the assassin job consisted of lots of infiltration work which helped train my social side. I choose to have a higher manipulation because these jobs tended to be deceitful. Finally, among the mental traits, I pick Perception 3, Intelligence 2 and Wits 2. I thought about having Wits 3 instead of Perception 3 since a good assassin should quickly be able to assess a situation and change their plan based on unforeseen circumstances. The reason I chose Perception before Wits was because my job also involved shadowing targets, being able to perceive better in darkness and being able to profile people from afar. I could have chosen to stick with Intelligence 1 in order to have both Perception and Wits at 3, but I wanted my character to be of at least average intelligence. Now when we have distributed 4 dots in every category, I tend to upgrade 2 of those categories to 6 dots. Because I want to be more physically fit and an expert at quick paced sneaky combat, I put 2 more dots in dexterity to bring it up to 5, leaving strength and stamina at 2. I have a picture in my mind of a character who is quite lithe and can easily hide in places a more bulky character could not. From the other categories, I decided to upgrade the social one because it felt more important to me that my character was a good infiltrator than a good strategist. I immediately want to upgrade manipulation rather than charisma because I think my characters lived most of their life deceiving others. I put up a mask before my own organization, hiding my more emotional and compassionate side. I put up a mask before my loved ones, hiding from them what kind of job I had and the pain it brought me. I put up a mask before the targets I was tasked to kill so that I could get close to them. And with that in mind, I add one more dot to manipulation, bring it to 4, and one more dot to appearance, bring it to 3. The extra dot in appearance will help me in general social situations against targets with low resolve. Now I must choose whether the physical or social traits should be my primary category. I feel that both would fit the character, but after thinking about it, I decide to go for the social traits. Because I am on the run from the organization, I want to be at least as good at hiding behind the disguise as physically hiding from you. I put the remaining two dots in manipulation and appearance, bringing them to 5 and 4. Looking over my attributes now, I'm happy with everything except for my low wits, thinking that it would be better off at 3. Fortunately, in step 7, we will be able to use bonus points to increase traits further. In step 3 of character creation, we're supposed to pick our abilities. The first thing we need to do is to select 5 cast abilities from a selection of 8 abilities associated with their cast. Since I chose Knight cast, my options are Athletics, Awareness, Dodge, Investigation, Larceny, Ride, Stealth and Socialize. I definitely want Stealth and Larceny since those are vital for my character concept. I'm also interested in Athletics and Dodge to represent my character's physical fitness and agility. This leaves one. Ride isn't interesting to me since I spent most of my life running on rooftops in a city. Awareness and investigation are both good for an assassin, but I decide to go for socialize since I have already determined that my character is very good in social situations. This makes my cast abilities athletics, dodge, larceny, stealth and socialize. Now I'm supposed to pick 5 favored abilities. These can be freely chosen without any cost restrictions. I definitely want at least a combat ability, but I'm not sure which one to take. Neither melee nor brawl feel like a good fit, but I'm definitely interested in martial arts. I also consider throwing because I like the idea of throwing poison needles from a distance. I cannot just pick martial arts because that ability is a bit special. In order to get it, I need to also pick brawl. I decide to pick both brawl and throne, mainly to get access to martial arts. I also pick awareness and investigation, which I considered earlier during my cast ability choices. And finally I add integrity because I feel that my character should have a great mental fortitude from having dealt with a traumatic life as well as torture training from the organization. The next step is to choose a supernal ability from one of the five chosen cast abilities. This represents the ability you exceed more in than any other ability. 
I originally thought about stealth for my own character, but as I've taken a more social turn, I thought that larceny could be more fitting, since it's a good ability for both physical and social actions befitting a sneaky character. I decide to pick larceny and then move on to distributing the ability dots. Unlike the attributes, all abilities start at zero and you have 28 dots to freely distribute. No ability can be raised higher than 3 without spending bonus points. I have already decided that I want at least one dot in all of my cast and favorite abilities. Since I wanted martial arts, I'm required to have brawl 1 in order to later choose martial arts. We'll address that further in later steps though. Having Brawl 1, Martial Arts 1, and 1 dot in every other cast or favored ability, I have distributed a total of 11 ability dots. Before I start increasing the traits I want to be extra good at, I look at the remaining abilities and consider if there is any of them I should have at least a basic competency in. I want to be good at poisons, and for that I should have 1 dot in craft poisons. Since I deal a lot with poisons and its effects on the human body, I thought about having 1 point in medicine as well for some basic anatomy training that benefits my poison expertise. Because I've lived a rough life, I add one dot in resistance as well. I also add one dot in both performance and presence to further boost my social expertise. Since my organization probably wrote coded messages to each other, I also add one dot in linguistics. Now I've distributed 17 dots, but I'm running a bit thin and it's time to specialize. Since I want to exceed in larceny and stealth, I immediately increase them both to 3. I also increase dodge and martial arts to 3. I increase Athletics, Throne and Socialize to 2. This is exactly 28 points, which is all I have to spend. I'm not entirely happy with this yet, but I know that I can spend bonus points later to increase more abilities. So I'll leave it like this for now. Before we move on to Merits, we must choose 4 specialties associated with any of our abilities. A specialty adds another die to the action when the ability is used for the specific expertise. These should be fairly specific so that they cannot be used in every situation. When selecting specialties, try to avoid any that you think will be used most of the time you apply an ability. For example, I add the Integrity specialty Resist Torture, which will help me in situations when someone tries to pressure me for information. I add the Stealth specialty Blending into Crowds to be able to more easily move undetected in groups of people, like in Assassin's Creed. I add the larceny specialty disguises, and finally I add the athletic specialty contortionism, because I feel that my character's athletic expertise should be their ability to take advantage of their agility. This is also a specialty that could add to some cool stunt potential. Moving on to merits, we have 10 points to distribute. Here you determine what kind of representation of your character concept is valid for the purposes of game mechanics and story. I usually start by defining what languages my character should be able to speak, but this time I decided that my character only knows one language, their, their native one, which will be river speak. Everyone has a native tongue without the need to spend merit points, but you can get additional languages for one language per point. I have already decided that my character will be a martial artist, so I choose the martial artist merit for 4 points. With this merit we can finally define what martial arts style I should have. After looking through all styles in the book, I decide to go for the Ebon Shadow style since it fits the sneaky character I want to play. I define my martial arts ability as being associated with that style and I note what kind of style weapons and such that gives me access to. In my case, I will be able to use size, tiger claws and knives with my martial arts ability and I will be able to deal lethal damage with unarmed attacks if I stunt. With 6 merit points to go, I think about my character concept and whether or not there are any must-have merits associated with it. Since I have fled from the organization, I should no longer have any backing in it, but I could still have some valuable contacts within the organization that are on my side. I decide to go with Contacts 1 associated with the criminal underworld of Nexus. Since I have decided to be a poison specialist, I also like the idea of having a loyal pet snake whose poison I can apply to my weapons. I select familiar at one dot, since a snake, though deadly, is a fairly small creature. I tell my storyteller that I want a black mamba as a familiar. I don't really bother taking note of the familiar statistics right now, and will do that during the finishing touches instead. If I invest in the survival ability, I would be able to improve my familiar and train it to learn new abilities, but I'm mainly focused on its poison and decide to go with it despite not having any survival. 
Now, now I have uh, four merit points to go. I'm, I'm not interested in investing in any resources or followers or such, since I think that my character should have mostly been traveling with nothing more than their belongings on their person. I like the idea of danger sense for three dots, since the organization is after me and I'm constantly watching my back. My very last merit point is spent on ambidextrous to remove the penalty for using my offhand. In summary, this is a good time to further define the character concept. Try to focus on the things that are most defining of your character before you start looking for mechanical benefits and such that would help you with your dice rolls. The merits that add dice are fairly expensive and I prefer to add them last when I know that I don't have to compromise on my concept. Before I move on to the next step, I decide to further define the organization that's after me and write them down as a flaw. My storyteller has pointed out to me that since I'm a solar exalted, the assassins within that organization should not in themselves be too dangerous for me to handle. Since I want my character to be on the run from them and feel threatened by them, we decide that they are led or controlled by a powerful god of murder who is sending out assassins after me unless I make ritualistic killings in their name. So, about once per season, I must find someone and kill them as a blood sacrifice to that god, and in doing so I guarantee the safety of my loved ones for another season. Doing this also informs the god of my location, which helps the, assassin track, the assassins to track me down for the god's sick game. Now, it feels more like a challenge worthy of a demigod, and the storyteller can use this as story hooks for the game. Flaws are entirely optional, but I personally like to add something to further define my character concept. Adding this dangerous enemy as a flaw is not directly represented by the examples in the book itself, but since this will be such a vital part of my character story, I like to see it represented like this. It, it'll be something to keep me on my toes. The core book has many different powers that can be accessible at character creation. When creating a fresh solar, you have 15 charms to start with, which can be swapped for martial arts charms, spells or evocations. But what exactly are your options? Well, not counting the excellency, which you get for free, only in the core book you have access to 774 solar charms, 108 martial arts charms, 24 spells and 48 evocations. If you have the Miracles of the Solar Exalted supplement, you get access to 83 additional solar charms, taking the total up to 857. If you also have Arms of the Chosen, you get another 381 evocations to choose from. The total number of powers you can use to customize your character now hits 1418, and there is much more to come as new books are being written. So, calling the game bloated is perfectly fine. These are many more powers than you can or are expected to keep track of, so how can you possibly siphon through these to find the ones you're looking for? Well, you don't. Before you even start looking at charms and other powers, you should already have a picture of the kind of character you want to play. You have already distributed dots amongst all your abilities. An easy way to get started with charms is to determine the primary, secondary and tertiary ability from the ones you have invested the most in, and focus the majority of your initial charm selections in those three abilities. The primary one should be the ability you chose as your supernal, since that's the one you should be most competent in. From your 15 available charms, I suggest taking about 10 of those from these three abilities. This will give you some early specializations that make your character competent within their fields of expertise. If you spread out too thin too early, you will have lots of basic competences without actually exceeding in anything. And if you focus too much on a single ability, you will be much too narrow in your expertise, and there's, there's a risk that you won't enjoy the game so much when you don't get the opportunity to take advantage of that expertise. The remaining 5 or so charms should be powers that help round out your character. I recommend taking at least one offensive and one defensive charm for added survivability, if you didn't already from your 3 expertise abilities. Even if you're not going to invest too much in combat abilities, choosing one dodge charm or one combat ability charm would still give you access to the excellences for those abilities, which could help a lot with survivability. More veteran players can be more loose with these choices, but new players should definitely keep them in mind. You should now have around 3 charms left. If you are starting with an artifact, you can invest some of these into evocations, or you could pick some spells if you are a sorcerer. Because you have already specialized in 3 abilities, and you have at least one offensive and defensive charm to help you survive, the remaining ones can be used for pretty much anything. 
Just taking a starting charm in a random ability can unlock a new excellency for your character. From all the hundreds of charms, you now only need to focus on the starting charms on some of the abilities that you're interested in. So the vast number of powers should in themselves not be too intimidating. As long as you remember to focus your attention on a few things instead of browsing everything for inspiration, you will never need to look at all 1418 powers to come up with some kind of character build. All you need to do is to decide what your focus should be and then start from there. And as your character gradually grows in power in game, you will have more time and consideration to figure out how to expand your powers based on what the game needs and what turns out to be fun to you. For my character, I have already decided not to have an artifact or sorcery, so I don't need to bother with any evocations or spells. With Larson as my supernal ability, I decide to start there. After looking through the charm tree, I decide to go with seasoned criminal method because it will help me to better navigate the criminal underworld in towns and villages I'll visit as part of the game. Flawless pickpocket technique and lock opening touch are both fun and useful charms that will definitely help me out if I want to steal stuff. I'm also interested in flawlessly impenetrable skies, but I notice that it needs larceny 4. Even though I only have larceny 3 right now, I take the charm anyway and mark down that I want to use bonus points to increase larceny to 4. Since larceny is supernal, I am free to pick charms that have higher essence requirements than 1. I decide to pick Living Shadow Preparedness, which requires larceny 3 and essence 2, because it will greatly benefit my larceny actions in a given day. The charm lets me bank a number of successes, which can later reflexively be used on larceny actions. I like this charm because the moats aren't committed and I can make the larceny roll first and decide to add the successes after. This is a perfect botch preventer. Since I've already spent 5 of my 15 charms in larceny, I decide to move on to stealth, my secondary trait. I can always get back to larceny later if I want more charms, but I feel that my 5 are more than enough. With stealth, I can only access Essence 1 charms, and I only bother reading them right now to avoid being overwhelmed. I decide to take Perfect Shadow Stillness, which lets me re-roll stealth actions. Easily Overlooked Presence method will help me become even better at blending in, so I take that as well. Finally, I take Blinding Battle Feint, which lets me roll Dexterity plus Stealth for Joint Battle. This charm is excellent for an Assassin-type character. I have now spent a total of 8 of my 15 charms, and decided to move on to get some combat charms. Looking at the martial arts charms for the Ebon Shadow style, I decide that I want access to Ebon Shadow form from the start. This requires martial arts 4 and 2 other charms called Nothing But Shadows and 7 points of weakness strike. I mark down that I want to use a bonus point to get martial arts 4, and I note the 3 charms. Now I'm up to 11 of 15 charms. With only 4 to go, I decide to spread out a bit to take some initial charms from abilities I'm less invested in. I start by taking a single dodge charm, since I feel like the martial arts charms didn't benefit my defenses too much. Reading the wind will let me substitute initiative for evasion, which could mean life or death in a combat situation. Watchman's infallible eye from investigation will let me be passively aware of whenever something feels wrong in a scene, such as if someone has bad intentions against me or there could be traps nearby. Precision of the striking raptor from throne will give me some options to attack better from a distance. Finally, graceful crane stance from athletics helps me keep my balance when I run around on rooftops. Now I've selected all 15 of my charms. With 5 in Larsene, 3 in Stealth, 3 in Ebon Shadow Style, and the rest spread out in other abilities, I feel like I have a solid expertise, but also some added competencies that will help me out in other situations. Since I've selected two combat abilities instead of only one, I invested more in combat charms than I probably would have done otherwise. If you decide to skip Throne and perhaps focus more on the social aspects of the character, then Master of Small Manners from Socialize could have been a very useful choice. The next step of character creation is to determine intimacies and your character's limit trigger. I usually do this at the finishing touches stage since especially intimacies usually require more careful thought. Intimacies determine the ties and principles of your character. What does your character care about? What are the codes they live by? You need at least four intimacies, one defining, one major, one negative and one positive. You can choose more if you want to. I decide to start with these four now, and then add more after I'm done with everything else and have more time to think about it. 
Since I've already established the premise for my character's story, I think about what is the most important to them. The reason why I'm on the run from the organization has less to do with my fear of them and more about my fear of my loved ones getting hurt. So, who are my loved ones? Since Wiper is an orphan, they live together with other orphans. The leader of the family of orphans was a young woman whom Wiper grew up with and has loved all her life. She is a positive defining tie. Viper has a very complicated relationship with the organization that is after them. They raised them all their life, but the organization is also responsible for most of the good things and bad things that's happened to them in their life. The organization is a major intimacy aware respect, which is neither entirely negative nor positive. I decide to make the negative intimacy into one for the god of murder itself. This is a major intimacy of fear. Finally, I want to give Wiper a principle as well, since all we had so far are ties. I choose the minor principle, never trust a stranger. Since we're playing Solar Exalted, we must also pick a limit trigger. All Solars were cursed by the enemies of the gods thousands of years ago, and this curse tends to take a Solar's emotions to the extreme during very specific circumstances. In order for this curse to trigger towards its limit, before coming into effect, we need to choose what kind of trigger the character is sensitive to. The limit trigger is a situation the character finds stressful, traumatic or frustrating. It's usually something associated with the character's story or intimacies, but it doesn't have to be. There are a few example triggers in the book that you can use, but you can just as well make up your own. I decide that I want my trigger to be whenever I'm backed against a wall and loses control over the situation. My storyteller is fine with the choice and it motivates me to roleplay my character as a bit of a control freak. That their entire life at the moment is outside of their control does not mean that the trigger will go into effect every waking moment of their life. The trigger goes into effect when that state of mind becomes overwhelming in the scene, when I see no clear way out and things get desperate. Now it's time to go back and fix the parts of our character that we want to improve further. You have 15 bonus points in total, and you can spend them on pretty much every trait there is, at various costs. Since I've already marked down Larson and Martial Arts, I spend 1 point per dot to increase them both to from 3 to 4. That's 2 bo bonus points total. I also want to increase Wits to 3, which costs 3 points, since it's part of the tertiary attribute category. I don't feel the need to spend any bonus points on getting additional charms, but I am in desperate need of more balanced ability scores. I spend 2 points to increase athletics from 2 to 4, 2 points to increase awareness from 1 to 3, then 2 points to increase stealth from 3 to 5. I also decide that I want Larson at 5. That's 12 points in total, leaving me with 3 more to spend. I could increase other traits such as willpower or add more merits, but I decide to increase Throne to 3, Integrity to 2, and Dodge to 4. Now I have no more points to spend. How you want to spend your points is up to you, but I recommend starting with rounding out your ability scores to make sure you feel that they represent your character's capabilities. Bonus points are not the most balanced system, since the bonus points cost vary from the experience costs later in game. It would benefit you to optimize your build using bonus points, and it can be done, but I personally don't like it. For example, it would have been much cheaper for me to make sure that all abilities I later will want at 5 or at 5 already now, since low scores are cheaper to upgrade than high scores when you use experience points. When I am a storyteller, I ask my players to avoid that kind of optimization, because I feel like it breaks immersion. When I'm a player, I avoid it by habit, even if my storyteller doesn't specifically ask me to. Finally, we're at the end stage, and we need to fill in all the stuff we're still missing. Our essence starts at 1, and our willpower at 5. We have 1 minus 0 health level, 2 minus 1 health levels, 2 minus 2 health levels, 1 minus 4 health level, and 1 incapacitated health level. Our personal essence pool is 13, and our peripheral essence pool is 33. The only one of these traits that we can modify during character creation is willpower. From my experience, a high willpower is usually more beneficial for sorcerers and characters who plan to do much social influence. Do keep in mind how many of your charms cost willpower though, and how many you think you use in any given day. I decide to stick with 5 for my characters and I think that will do for now. As for other traits, natural soak is equal to 1 stamina, in my case it's 2. 
It would benefit me to get some kind of armor, but I cannot actually use armor together with my martial arts style. Instead, I will be doomed to have a low soak with the risk of losing initiative quickly in combat. Resolve is determined by half your wits plus integrity rounded up, which in my case is 3. This can be further modified by your, int by your intimacies, which is why I encourage having many of them. Your guile is equal to half your manipulation to socialize rounded up, which in my case is 4. My rush pool is equal to my dexterity plus athletics, which is 9, and my disengage pool is equal to my dexterity plus dodge, which is also 9. I also have an evasion score that's half my dexterity plus dodge rounded up, and a parry score that's half, that's half my dexterity plus brawl or martial arts rounded up. Some weapons add to the parry score, but mundane light weapons do not, and unarmed attacks count as mundane light weapons. In my case, both evasion and parry become 5. Finally, my joint battle pool is equal to wits plus awareness, which is 6, but since I have the charm blinding battle feint, I will, in some situations, be able to use dexterity plus stealth instead, which is 10. So I mark down both results on my sheet. We are pretty much done now, but I want to add some additional details. Every solar has a totemic anima banner that is unique to them. This is a cool visual that appears when you are at bonfire level of display and spends at least 5 peripheral modes of essence on action. Since I have a bit of a snake theme with Viper, I decide to take inspiration from Yamata no Orochi from Japanese mythology. My totemic display will be an 8 head and an 8 tailed snake that rises above my enemies like 8 vicious cobras. The only thing I have left now is to sit down with the storyteller and determine some starting equipment that could be vital for my character. Since I don't have any resources, I only add some details about the stuff on my person. I note down some weapons that interest me, such as knives and throwing needles, and some details about my clothes, how I look, and anything that I feel is too important to ignore. I also find some stats to represent my familiar, and note down the effects of snake venom, since that's something I will use quite a lot. I also take some time to come up with more intimacies to further get a feel for my character's personality. If I feel artistic, I can try to make a drawing of my character, which is actually something I did for Viper several years ago. So here are some pictures of what I had in mind. So this brings us to the end of this video. This was a long one and respect to you for sticking with me all the way through. I hope that this gave some tips and tricks on how to think when approaching character creation. Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't necessarily do every step in order like this, especially when it comes to bonus points, which I normally spend throughout the entire process. Intimacies and limit trigger are also something I often do last as part of the finishing touches. It is a long process though, with many steps before you have a complete character. I hope that this video has been helpful enough in making this process feel more fun and less overwhelming. Exalted is an amazing game, and I feel that amazing games need amazing characters. I think I did an amazing character today, and I hope you did as well. Finally, see the links below for where you can learn more about the game, and remember to like and subscribe if you like what I'm doing and want to see more. Until then, see you in creation.